Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer and this is Walk Time Blog number 31, tour of the Advanced Instrumentation Technology Center at Mount Stromlo. Uh, now, just recently I had a really, really cool opportunity. I was put in touch uh, with some people at the AITC by uh, Paul Shimkoviak and uh, arranged to go up and visit them. So the Advanced Instrumentation Technology Center is attached to the Mount Stromlo Observatory and run by ANU, I believe, or affiliated with ANU. So we had the opportunity to meet um, Dr. Naomi Mathers, who is the Industry Liaison Engineer at the AITC. And we were also given a tour by Roger Franzen, who is the Tech Program Manager uh, at the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And we got to see some amazing gear. and. So I apologise for the audio and things in this, it was a bit of an impromptu thing. We were there having a look around and I pulled out the camera, I pulled out the phone and just started recording. So I'll just take a few snippets from it and um, because you probably won't be able to hear a lot of the conversation, I'll just put some subtitles in as well that'll explain different things we're looking at. But the upshot is it's an amazing facility. Um, they have used um, funding available for uh, education and for um, for development of the observatory and used it to build an incredible facility which has all sorts of spin-off applications uh, particularly in the space industry for things like satellite integration and testing so check this out it's pretty cool contemporary projects um, which was a binocular telescope. The actual instrument in here was originally intended to be flown on a mission called Starlab mm -hmm. which, could have, which would have co-orbited with the Hubble. Mm -hmm. The objective of Starlab would have been wide field of view, find a camera for Starlab which for Star, not Starlab, it was Hubble, um, which would have uh, provided the narrow field of view. Starlab, the mission, was a joint Canadian NASA Australian mission, mm -hmm. and Australia's ticket was a large format photon counting array detector. Now, Canadians decided to redirect their, their funds to the uh, uh, Canada Arm activities, mm -hmm. the space station. Project Starlab fell apart, but NASA said, Well, we like your detector, why don't you qualify it on the Getaway Special Program, the gas can program? Okay. So uh, that's what happened. The Australian government funded uh, $5 million. So this is the actual primary instrument. So this was open to space. It's a binocular UV telescope uh, with um, selective coatings on the optics. Those optics channel UV photons to a microchannel plate image intensifier tube, which then causes a visible spectrum burst on the, the intensified side which is collected via those coherent fiber optic bundles that you can see. Yep. So when you look down those, those fiber pipes, you will you see a coherent image. Yep. And then that, those images were channeled to the best CCDs that we could get in those days. Yep. And I can't even remember the, the, the model of them any longer. And that created uh, a large format image, photon by photon, hence the term large format photon counting array detector. And this, these... Uh, this is this, uh, the payload that was open to space. This one remained hermetically sealed in a dry nitrogen environment. There was a power supply and the data recording. And those are actually F-111 uh, gun camera tape recorders yeah. because they were designed to already be vibration tolerant uh, in, being in an aircraft. And um, uh, they were available. And most of the remote sensing spacecraft of the, the early to mid 90s were still using tape recorders. This is termed Wombat XL, but it's actually a modular design where this annular section here is in fact the portion which houses the thrust balance and all of the, the test equipment for the plasma thruster. At this end there's a plume capture system and, and uh, what uh, we can do is when we don't want to, to test thrusters in there, you can remove the annular portion close it up and you're left with a three meter diameter by four meter long thermal vacuum, vacuum chamber, chamber yeah. which awesome. is the largest in, in Australia. There are virtually no other thermal vacuum chambers. 
So that will actually sit on the floor here, which is why these tape lines are on the floor, to show where it will survive. Awesome. Thank you. So this, this second here, the tank will be, its access will be along. Back here, it's a uh, lot of this class 10,000 clean room in Australia. 110 square meters of class 10,000 clean room, which will enable us to do multiple projects simultaneously. The GM TIFF's instrument we're building for the GMT telescope, as well as some of the laser tomography, adaptive optics system, and subsystem work we're developing, plus other missions. So if we're doing uh, CubeSats or, or larger optical payloads, we will have two levels of vibration table. The first, the first grade has already been ordered, and uh, we are in the process of having the seismic block uh, designed up because it's a concrete and steel seismic block which will be cast in situ. These piers here will have air bearings on them and the, cast, the, the, the seismic block will be cast with just enough room for some brave fellow or lady to slip down between and be able to service the, uh, the air bearings on occasion if necessary. On top of this will uh, we'll sit uh, initially a 24 kilonewton vibration table with a slip table as well as uh, uh, single axis uh, driver uh, and that will enable us to do uh, test articles up to 25 kilos in a full 30G random. Wow. Uh, now that's only a small payload to test art mass but it does mean that if you are only doing uh, low level side sweep you can actually use heavier masses on there. The next step after that uh, as we roll in more funding will be to add what we hope to be a, a, about a 60 kilonewton uh, shaker which will enable us to do test articles up to about 250-300 kilos. Found in the past and certainly uh, whilst running our space, uh, we had to do it ourselves because there was such a low volume of activity that nobody else bothered to do it. Uh, so this is a specialised room that we've set up especially for this. Don't pull the handle behind oh, you. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I won't be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> And when you, you when you can control it, so you can control it through a satellite. Um, you can do it so it's sun pointing. So you have a torch, and it will align itself with the sun. You can control how many, how fast it will rotate, how many revolutions. Um, so the whole idea is you're training students in not only the onboard systems, but the operation of the satellite. So you can you know, disassemble the whole lot and have a look at the, the different boards which will have everything from the control system through the powers, power system through to um, oh, yeah, the whole lot. It's, it's, it's very much about um, teaching students about the, the different components and how to control said satellite. Outsource it. It's two, two and a half meters in diameter as a hexagonal uh, structure and two meters tall. Ooh. We can't do that on machines here. Is that a CNC machine I see back there? <laughs> oh. Will do. Now, this is a serious CNC machine. Capacity here for us to create bespoke things. If there's a specific requirement, it can either be uh, uh, made using 3D printing or it can be machined up in these facilities as a jobbing type facility, which is really the, the reason why we have it because sometimes it's still quicker to do it in house than to go and, and outsource. You know? Yeah, this is like the most well-equipped hacker space I've ever seen. Oh, some, some. <laughs> <laughs>